In the last decade of his life, Johann Sebastian Bach was working on his last, and in some ways greatest, contrapuntal masterpiece known as The Art of Fugue. In this video, Anne Page and Paul Binsky discuss this astonishing music to accompany Anne's YouTube performance of the whole work at the Dutch Church in London. The Art of Fugue is a collection of 14 fugues and four canons, which Bach intended to publish. The title, Art of Fugue, was added to the cover of its early autograph, now in Berlin, dating to around 1742. Unfortunately, Bach died in July 1750 during the publishing process. It appeared, in print, under the editorship of his sons in 1751, with the title Die Kunst der Fuge, The Art of Fugue. The Art of Fugue is based on a single theme, rather like a set of variations. Its claim to fame rests partly on the brilliant way this theme is developed throughout the work, and also because the work's final fugue, as many think, was broken off by Bach's illness and death in 1749-50. As a result, the work has real mystique, a romantic ruin. Would it have been thought of differently if Bach had completed it? In the 1740s in Germany, fugue was a dying art form and had never really been theorised. Fugue was a body of practices, not theories. The Art of Fugue isn't a technical treatise, but a practical demonstration of how the combining of voices and ancient art can be an intellectual and expressive medium. In the printed version, the fugues are called contrapuncti, which implies that Bach thought of them as something almost rising above conventional fugue writing. Bach's aim was to research the musical potential of a single idea, a short, motto-like theme, which he then unpacks or explicates, plucks out the potential, like a genetic code or seed. By deploying all the methods of counterpoint in his very considerable arsenal as a composer, Bach produced one of the all-time great masterworks of European music. Understandably, it's a work of remarkable intensity, its monothematic basis being Bach's preferred method from the late 1730s, as in the Goldberg Variations and Musical Offering. It's now believed that Bach had begun work on the Art of Fugue by about 1740. Before turning to the individual fugues, and finally the completion, we should see Bach in the context of his time. By the 1740s, Bach's situation at the St Thomas School in Leipzig, where he was cantor, was not happy. He had fallen out with his employers because he felt they didn't value the art of music, and after many outbursts had retreated finally to his composing office, sinking into himself, and in many ways abandoning public religious music. Leipzig was a great university and publishing city, but Bach had no degree. He was a practical musician. Taste was moving in a new direction, represented by the music of his sons. Yet here he explored the depths of music and wrote difficult, awe-inspiring music which demonstrated his art. We must imagine Bach with his glass of brandy, his pipe, probably a pair of spectacles, thinking through the hardest of musical puzzles. The Art of Fugue is written in a single key, D minor, close to the Dorian mode of church music. Its motto theme seems to have originated within the Bach family, in a set of musical notes representing his exchanges with his most talented son, Wilhelm Friedmann. This fragment was then perfected by Bach. <laughs> The theme consists of a triad of D minor, followed by rising and falling stepwise movement. It is invertible, that means it can be played upside down, and both upside down and right way up versions can be combined. Thank you. 
The upright or rectus version of the theme contains the notes of the first line of Luther's great Easter hymn, Christ lag in Todesbanden, Christ lay in the bonds of death. The first line of the hymn can even be harmonised by the theme. The chorales of the Lutheran Church were known to Bach since childhood and formed the basis of much of his music for organ and for the church. Of course, it is impossible to prove that Bach was intentionally referring to this chorale, but the resemblance is nevertheless striking. Bach used various musical signatures throughout his career, particularly in the late works he contributed to the Society for Music and Science, started by Lorenz Mitzler, about which we will hear more later. The Bach numbers arise from the ancient practice of geometria, in which letters of the alphabet are given numbers. A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals 3, and so on. Hence, B, A, C, H equals the number 14, and J, S, B, A, C, H equals the number 41. It has been recognised for some time that Bach encoded many numbers into his works and that the numbers 14 and its retrograde 41 represent a kind of signature. These numbers are present in the art of fugue and Paul will discuss their particular significance for the final 14th fugue. The BACH motif, the letters B, A, C and H, correspond to the musical pitches B-flat, A-natural, C-natural and B-natural. And this chromatic motif is used by Bach as a musical signature. In the art of fugue, it also appears in retrograde form H-C-A-B. The Art of Fugue is, of course, a monumental work of counterpoint, and this was not what the musical world of the mid-18th century appreciated or even approved of, as taste had moved towards a more simple, melodious, immediately appealing style. Bach had been attacked in print for composing overly complicated music with unnatural melodic contortions. It may have been his intention to raise this monument to the art of counterpoint at the very time he perceived that art to be waning. The art of fugue is presented in open score. Each line of music has its own stave, like voices in a choir. This only served to further dislocate it from a musical culture which had lost any connection with the performing practices of earlier times. Most of Bach's music was largely forgotten after his death, an almost total eclipse, except for some of the keyboard works, such as the well-tempered clavier, which were known to professional musicians and connoisseurs. The resurrection of Bach's music for a wider music-loving public had to wait until the 19th century. But the art of fugue fell into a kind of limbo known only by reputation and considered to be a demonstration of abstract music, not meant for performance. This view persisted well into the 20th century, and it's only in recent decades that it has been extensively studied and performed for the first time in its history. In this part of the video, 
we'll look at Bach's links with music of the past and some composers he studied, performing the work on the organ, and an overview of the fugues and canons. First of all, Bach's use of music from the past. The art of fugue is Bach's summing up the contrapuntal art of centuries. Counterpoint, or the art of combining independent musical lines, sits at the heart of Bach's art, and he shows its power to be renewed to convey new musical thoughts. The musical theorist Marpurg wrote in his preface to the 1752 edition of The Art of Fugue, in this work are contained the most hidden beauties possible to the art of music. Throughout his life, since childhood in fact, Bach copied or collected music from past centuries and his own time, from Germany and all of Europe. The art of fugue is the fruit of Bach's absorption of polyphonic music, whose beginning goes back to the Renaissance. It contains some passages which seem to be tributes by Bach to composers whose fugal composition he particularly admired. The use of key and tuning system. The entire work is in the key of D minor, an anchor to the past as the first mode of the modal system, which had its roots in medieval plain song. This later became known as the first tone, by music theorists of later centuries. In the first four fugues, Bach shows the evolution of keyboard temperament from the old mean tone tuning system with a limited range of keys to the well-tempered tuning systems developed in the later 17th century. In the well-tempered tunings, as in equal temperament that we use today, all keys and therefore all modulations can be used. The first fugue uses only B flat, F sharp, C sharp, G sharp and E flat, exactly the range of notes available in mean tone tuning. The second fugue adds D sharp and A flat to that, moving away from pure mean tone. The third fugue adds D flat and the fourth adds G flat and A sharp, so now all enharmonic equivalents are present, as C sharp equals D flat, E flat equals D sharp, and so on. Bach acknowledges the past through his choice of musical notation. Many generations before Bach's time, there was an established practice of presenting works of counterpoint intended for the keyboard in open score, so that the individual voice parts could be more easily followed. In 1635, Girolamo Frescobaldi published a collection of organ music, the Fiori Musicali, or Musical Flowers, using open score, making a point of saying in his introduction to the reader, I consider it most important for performers to play from open score, not only for learning to compose in this style, but as a necessary exercise in order to distinguish the true gold of virtuous action from ignorance. Bach owned and studied a copy of the Fiori Musicali, a collection of three masses for organ. We can think of him consciously continuing the tradition of contrapuntal invention, using the same notational method of open score. As we shall see, there seem to have been other acknowledgements Bach made of Frescobaldi's contrapuntal idiom in general, and the Fiori in particular. The influence of an important teacher from the past. Svelink was a key figure in establishing a strong school of organ playing in the north of Germany, as many German organists went to Amsterdam to study with him. From his youth, Bach was directly connected with organists trained by these students of Svelink, through personal contact with Reinken in Hamburg and Buxtehude in Lübeck. Svelink in the north and Frescobaldi in the south of Europe were crucial in shaping the keyboard music of the German lands in the 17th century.
In Contrapunctus V, from the Art of Fugue, bar 65 seems to contain a quotation from Svelink's Fantasia Chromatica, bars 133 to 140. Svelink's Fantasia Chromatica contains many contrapuntal devices, including augmentation and diminution of the theme. Augmentation means doubling the note values so that the theme moves more slowly, and diminution halves the note values so that it moves more quickly. Bach would have known this technique from its use by other composers of the Renaissance as well. Here's the beginning of Svelink's Fantasia Chromatica, with the theme in its original version. At the end of the piece, the theme comes in successively faster note values. Bach used the techniques of augmentation and diminution in Contrapunctus 7. The subject appears at three different speeds, the normal speed, half speed and double speed. The French style. In Contrapunctus 6, with its title In Stilo Francese, or in French style, Bach acknowledges the third important national style which shaped his own keyboard art. With its stately dotted rhythms, the so called French overture, which started with Lully at the court of Louis XIV, became popular throughout Europe along with the architecture of the Palace of Versailles. The subject is presented in diminution as well as rectus and inversus forms, adding a layer of complexity as the subject is now moving at two different speeds as well as in stretto or overlapping entries. As the title suggests a performance in the French style, 
The rhythmic convention of note inégale, or unequal notes, is applied to the semiquavers in this performance. Pairs of conjunct notes notated with equal values are played slightly long short, according to the convention of note inégale, which is similar to the swing applied in jazz. In keeping with French registration practice for fugues, this performance uses a reed-based registration, or grand jeu. <laughs> study of French composers included copying in full the organ book, or Livre d'Orgue, by Nicolas de Grigny, which included a complete organ mass and several hymns. Grigny's elaborately contrapuntal fugues in five voices must have been of a special interest to Bach. tradition of learned counterpoint. In his youth, Bach admired the Danish composer Dietrich Buxtehude so much that he journeyed hundreds of miles on foot from Arnstadt to Lübeck to learn from him. Buxtehude was steeped in the contrapuntal tradition and composed two pairs of works with four voices, which are subsequently inverted voice by voice. The original version is called Contrapunctus. Its inversion is titled Evolutio. The hymn set is Mit Fried und Freud ich fahre dahin, In Peace and Joy I Now Depart, the Nunc Dimittis. They are part of Buxtehude's funeral music for his father. In the first setting, the voice parts are exchanged so that soprano becomes bass and alto becomes tenor. The second setting inverts the melodic lines as well as the voice parts, the same technique used by Bach in the four-voice pair of mirror fugues from The Art of Fugue.
In the art of fugue, Bach titles each fugue contrapunctus, the same term used by Buxtehude. It's the Latin term for counterpoint. With the pair of mirror fugues in four voices, inverted note for note in all parts, Bach continues the tradition of learned counterpoint practiced by Buxtehude and other composers of an earlier generation. This represents the ultimate contrapuntal challenge. In Bach's manuscript, the two versions are printed one above the other as a mirror image. Bach then applies the idea to three voices. The mirror fugues in three voices employ a different method of inversion in which each successive entry inverts the last. This is easily heard as the second and third notes of each entry form an octave leap, which goes alternately up and then down. of complete independence between the hands and feet of the organist are trials of technique familiar from Bach's six sonatas for two keyboards and pedal, composed with his son Willem Friedemann's organ training in mind. Performing the art of fugue on the organ. In Bach's time there was not so great a distinction between the different keyboard instruments the most common of which were harpsichord, clavichord and organ. The same music could be played on any of them, provided they had a similar range of notes. A pedal keyboard was provided for most organs in Germany in Bach's time, and for some clavichords on which organists could rehearse at home. Bach's greatest renown in his own time was as an organist without equal in both invention and technique. Of all the keyboard instruments, it is the organ on which a single performer can realise all the contrapuntal voices. With both hands and feet, even the mirror fugues, with their very large stretches, can be played by using the pedals as well. The open scoring suggests not only one, but many options. A single manual or two manuals, either with or without pedals. This performance draws on all of those options, as well as on occasion using the pedals as a kind of third hand coupled to the manuals. There are advantages to hearing the work on the organ. The notes sustain for their full duration, without the decay of sound of the stringed keyboards. The organ colours can underscore changes in mood or affect. The multiple keyboards of the organ offer contrasted tone colours to make the contrapuntal lines more clearly distinguishable. This performance of the Art of Fugue is just one of many possible realisations at the organ. It is informed by a study of Bach's own organ works and the registration practices used by him and his contemporaries. There are parallels between the Art of Fugue and an organ work of Bach which was his first published music for the instrument. This appeared in 1739 as the third part of the Klavier Übung, of which the Goldberg variations form the fourth part. It's very different to the Art of Fugue, as it's a collection of choral preludes framed by the monumental Prelude and Fugue in E-flat, BWV 552. But there are certain features which find a parallel with it. It's a large-scale compendium, intended for connoisseurs, as is the art of fugue. Before the final multi-subject fugue in Clavier Übung III are four duetti, studies in strict two-part counterpoint. 
before the final multi-subject fugue in the art of fugue are four canons in strict two-part counterpoint. The third part of the Klavier Übung includes settings specifically designated for pedaliter and for manualiter performance, showing that a pedal part is not necessarily a determining feature of an organ work. Both the fugue in E-flat from Klavier Übung 3 and the final fugue of the Art of Fugue have interesting points of comparison. Stylistically, both opening sections are in stile antico, or a Renaissance style of counterpoint. Procedurally, the theme of the first section combines with that of the other sections of each fugue. Motivically, the middle section in quaver movement of the E-flat fugue has a similar outline to the second section of the final fugue from the Art of Fugue. The sequence of fugues offers contrast of affect and an evolution of contrapuntal techniques from simple to complex. The first four are simple fugues, alternately based on the upright and inverted forms of the subject. The first and third fugues use a more mellifluous vocal style and the second and fourth use keyboard style. Bach uses a device to connect the sequence of fugues by giving a single entry or group of entries which diverge from the prevailing style of their fugue to prefigure a technique used in a later one. Contrapunctus I in bar 32 has a single entry of the subject in the bass voice which is exceptional in having the interval of a third rather than a second between the fourth and fifth notes, a technique used more extensively in Contrapunctus IV starting at bar 61, again in the bass voice, now with the inverted version of the subject. In Contrapunctus II, a single entry of the subject off the beat, bar 69 in the tenor voice, anticipates number 3, bar 23, in the soprano and the next two tenor entries of the subject. In Contrapunctus III, this same bar, 23, has a version of the subject appearing off the beat and with passing notes, which becomes a regular feature of the subject in Contrapunctus V. In Contrapunctus IV, the theme in close stretto from bar 107 anticipates the next group of fugues which explore the subject treated in stretto where the entries overlap. The next three fugues Contrapunctus 5, 6 and 7 are so-called stretofugues, as the subject overlaps with itself. Passing notes are added to the subject, making the number of notes it contains 14, a bark number. The subject appears in both rectus and inversus versions in each fugue. 
In contrapunctus 5, we have various intervals of timing and pitch of the overlapping entries. In contrapunctus 6, the subject appears in diminution. In contrapunctus 7, the subject appears in both augmentation and diminution. Fugues 8, 9, 10 and 11 are double and triple fugues in which the theme is combined with new subjects. Contrapunctus 8 and Contrapunctus 11 share their material and in both the main theme is changed rhythmically to include rests. Contrapunctus 8 has three voices and is the longest fugue so far with 188 bars. It begins with a completely new subject which includes chromatic steps in its descent through an octave. Contrapunctus 11 uses the same themes as Contrapunctus 8 but with four voices. It's packed with BACH motifs and its reverse form HCAB and moves into a new world of chromatic harmony which even to a modern ear sounds extraordinary. This passage moves from B flat to E major, keys at the farthest possible remove from each other, through an eight bar sequence whose chord sounds strangely like jazz. In the final engraved edition of the work, fugues 8 and 11 are separated by two fugues in which a new subject is treated fugally, then combined with the main theme. Contrapunctus 9 uses fast toccata-like figuration with the main theme in long notes like a cantus firmus. Contrapunctus 10 uses the version of the main theme with rests for its new subject, which begins with a three-note cell immediately followed by its inversion. The Canons Within this most strict of forms, Bach achieves an amazing variety of expressive effect. Different time signatures and the addition of embellishing figures to the theme create a different mood for each of the four. Canon a la ottava, canon at the octave, in 916 time with triplets decorating the theme to give a light, dance-like character. Canon alla decima, contrapunto alla terza, canon at the tenth, counterpoint at the third. 4-4 four, four time and 12-8 time. The inverses version of the theme syncopated, 
The counter melody in flowing triplets creates a gentle pastoral quality. Canon in duodecima in contrapunto a la quinta. Canon at the twelfth with counterpoint at the fifth. A la brave time, the rector's version of the theme divided into sextuplets and quavers with a rest after the striking interval of a diminished seventh. <laughs> Augmentationum in contrario motu. Canon by augmentation in contrary motion. The theme is syncopated and from its opening minor sixth imbued with chromaticism. This is a tour de force with strict intervallic inversion in notes of double value. The parts exchange halfway through so that the canon works both at the octave below and the octave above the leading voice. The extraordinary contour of the melodic line which ranges widely across the keyboard with its chromatic passages, surprising leaps and syncopations makes this a piece which would sound at home in the mid-20th century era of neo-tonal composition. <laughs> The 14th and final fugue presents a summary of Bach's panorama of music history evident in the earlier fugues, from the stile antico of the first section through to the advanced chromaticism of the third section, based on BACH in musical notes. The Bach numbers crop up many times. In the first section, the subject of seven notes and its answer of seven notes equal 14. In the second section, there are 41 notes in the second subject. In the third section, based on BACH, is 41 bars long. Bach returns to the Renaissance for the first section. Its theme has a similarity to one of the pieces in Frescobaldi's Fiori Musicali. The Ricerca dopo il credo, from the Messa della Madonna, or Richard on the Creed from the Mass for the Madonna. With the chromatic notes removed, it gives the outline of the first theme of the Art of Fugue. does the opposite with the canon by augmentation and in contrary motion, 
when he adds chromatic notes to the main theme, a paraphrase technique, as it were, in reverse. There are some common motifs and techniques, including inversion of the subject, in the following passages. The engraved edition of The Art of Fugue, which came out after Bach's death, includes the organ chorale prelude titled Wenn wir in höchsten Nöten sein, as a kind of compensation for the unfinished final fugue. The setting is for organ, presented in open score and requiring pedals and two manual keyboards. Bach was now at the very end of his final illness dictating the music to his son-in-law, Alt Nicol. He asked for an alternative title to be given to this work, Vor deinen Thron tret ich hiermit, Before thy throne I now appear. Two Bach numbers are signified in this work. There are 14 printed notes in the first line of the chorale and 41 in the whole melody. <laughs> controversial aspect of the Art of Fugue is its ending. In an appendix to the autograph in Berlin is a now incomplete fugue of 239 bars of great solemnity and tremendous mounting tension, the longest fugue Bach ever undertook. Its unfolding creates an extraordinary level of expectation and then it ends mid-voice. <laughs> possibly considerably later date, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach wrote a note into the music at this point that the composer had died, having introduced a subject based on his own name in German musical notation. 
The inscription romanticises the situation, the tragic end, cut off in his prime of a romantic genius, an idea just emerging at that time. And also hints perhaps that this was a kind of nemesis for having the pride to insert his own name at all. Certainly the break-off point is one of the most dramatic in all music, if understood as the moment when Bach died. But is this what happened? Up to this point, Bach had fully composed 13 fugues and four canons. Since the 1742 autograph, he had amended the canons and added an entirely new fugue, now number four. We say 13 fugues because the two mirror fugues are really single fugues with double aspects, not separate compositions, so they aren't counted twice. No composer would end a work with the unlucky number 13, so it's reasonable to think that Bach had planned a final 14th fugue. And, as we've already heard, there may be reasons for thinking that the number 14 mattered to him. In the 1751 print, the autograph of this fragment was adapted into open score and published with a brief cadence a few bars before the actual autograph unravels. Its covering preface simply states that the author was prevented by his eye disease and death from completing the last fugue, in which at the entrance of the third subject he mentions himself by name. We don't know who wrote this note, but it's unambiguous. This was the last fugue. In 1752 the work was re-released. This print has a longer preface by F. W. Marburg, which states that Bach's illness surprised him in the midst of working out the last fugue, in which the introduction of the third subject he identifies himself by name. Again, unambiguous. This is the last fugue. Instead, a chorale on Wenn wir in Hürten Nürten sein was added in compensation. Nothing is said about the other fugues at all. The problem for later commentators is partly that the fugue doesn't contain the basic motto theme, and this has led some to argue that it had another purpose, even though it's in the same key as the Art of Fugue. But against this, it must be said that other fugues, such as Contrapunctus VIII, significantly delay the entry of the motto subject, so this is debatable. In Contrapuntus VIII, the motto appears exactly at midpoint at bar 94 of 188 bars. Rhetorically, Bach may have been holding the motto back as a final brilliant combination. In the great C major organ fugue, BWV 547, a fifth part for the pedal in augmentation is delayed amazingly. Postponement was a device he used in his later works. More importantly, the decision by the editors to include an incomplete fugue without the composition's basic motto theme was an extraordinary publishing move. The Art of Fugue, after all, was a commercial venture, and to include an unfinished work of uncertain purpose in it would be very risky. So its inclusion with a specific preface actually drawing attention to the problem is the single most important piece of circumstantial evidence that Bach and his family indeed intended this fragmentary fugue to end the work, and that it was part of the collection. Also, its signature suggests the end of something. Normally, we sign letters at the end. And there are other reasons for thinking that this work is indeed the finale. So let's look closer at the fugue itself. First, the autograph is written on one side of five sheets of thin engraving paper, the fugue unwinding on the fifth page. The fugue has three subjects which combine on page five. The first is a solemn subject, a palindrome with the same notes backwards and forwards. It has seven notes and resembles the motto theme in its first, second and fourth notes. <laughs> The second subject enters in bar 114. In common with many Bach multiple subject fugues, it contrasts with the slow first subject by being in running quavers and is 41 notes long. 41 is the retrograde of 14 and is also the geometric sum of J.S. Bach. So far 7, 14 and 41 are involved. 
Bach then combines subjects one and two in different ways, including strato. At bar 193 enters the Bach subject, Bach signature. This continues to bar 233 when Bach combines all three subjects. So we have 1, 1 plus 2, 3, 1 plus 2 plus 3. This combinatorial structure is exactly the same as the E flat St. Anne organ fugue, which ends the Clavier Übung Part 3, also a published work which has three subjects. Clavier Übung 3 is worth studying because it's possible that Bach adopted specific structures for his relatively few printed works. For instance, Clavier Übung 3, which consists of chorales from the Lutheran Catechism, ends with four duetti, two-part imitative counterpoints, and a final grand fugue. This may well have been the order at the end of the Art of Fugue, with four canons, and a final fugue. However, this fragmentary fugue has four voices, and this raises the question whether it was intended to have four subjects, so deliberately surpassing the E-flat clavier Übung III three-subject fugue. Here the debate begins, because in 1881 the Beethoven scholar Notterbohm noticed that the motto theme of the Art of Fugue actually combines with the other three subjects, and this is true both in rectus and in versus. It fits very well rhythmically, as Donald Tovey showed. reading Bach signed this fugue with his own name, then cyclically tied the work together with the motto subject, bringing our knowledge of the motto theme itself to its fullest final extent. In a sense, the work is an enigma fugue, a puzzle like Bach's canons. And this type of thinking takes us all the way back to Frescobaldi, who used similar devices. Notterbohm's finding has been subject to fierce but not fully justified criticism on musical and combinatorial grounds. Some commentators note, for example, that the motto theme, combined with the second subject when above it, creates a parallel fifth, actually an augmented and then a perfect fifth. For some, a classic error of counterpoint harmony. They conclude from this that this combination is no more than a coincidence and that Bach could not have made such a mistake. Yet none of these musical arguments is really convincing. And here's why. First of all, the parallel fifth argument can be set aside for two reasons. There's one in the musical offerings first fugue, for instance, a published work, and there are several others. The second is that the fifths occur only when the motto theme is pitched above the second subject, not below it. It only depends which combinations Bach used. The third is that when all four themes are combined, as in Notterbohm's version, the parallel fifth coincides with the dissonant first note, B-flat, of the Bach theme, and is therefore not really heard as a prominent fifth at all. In a persuasive argument, Kevin Corson has anyway described these so-called rules as zombie rules, applicable only to a textbook approach to fugue. Bach knew better. For many, us included, the quadruple combination works wonderfully. Here are a few other arguments for including this fugue as the final 14th fugue. The fugue is in the same Dorian church key and affect as the Art of Fugue. It is written to fall under two hands like the Art of Fugue, but can be realised effectively on the organ, its textures being similar to the St Anne fugue for organ. It was found in the same portfolio as the Art of Fugue. It's written out on one side of the same engraving paper used for the Art of Fugue as a whole. The reverse of its fourth page was used for the proof corrections for the Art of Fugue. If it was an entirely separate work, why did this happen? The fact of its signature suggests it comes at the end of something, because this was Bach's practice in the musical offering and the canonic variations, also late works. As noted, the editors 
took a punt on its inclusion at the expense of drawing attention to the problem of its incompleteness. A risk suggesting not confusion, but its authenticity to Bach's plan. Others also argue that because the final fugue is written in closed or keyboard score, that's to say on two staves and not four, it can't have been part of the art of fugue, which was autographed and printed in open score. They also note that in his obituary of Bach, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach said that the art of fugue was left incomplete, with a last but one fugue on three subjects, in which Bach introduced his own name, B-A-C-H. He said that there was going to be a final fugue on four themes invertible note for note, but of this there's no trace. In effect, the art of fugue was to have 15 fugues, as it does in Tovey's proposed completion. The difficulty with this is that the published prefaces contradict this by stating simply that the fragmentary fugue was the final fugue ended by Bach's illness. It was thus presented by the editors, not by Bach himself, as a fugue on three subjects, or fuga a tre soggetti. It's equally likely that Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, who was in Berlin at the time the art of fugue was being completed in Leipzig, got confused about the plans because Bach's final months were dominated by illness and blindness. His words are in conflict. A possible solution is that C.P.E. Bach had been aware that Bach was pondering two different finales, a truly invertible four-subject mirror fugue, or the one we have. The mirror version in four subjects would be very hard to realise, so it was set aside for a freer fugue, like the St. Anne fugue. One argument not hitherto advanced by scholars can be used to underline the idea that Bach intended 14 full fugues. As we know, Bach had already made a set of 14 compositions, the 14 canons, he added to his, his copy of the Goldberg Variations, Klavier Übung 4. In 1747, Bach was persuaded to join a corresponding society about musical science, convened by his pupil Lawrence Midsler. Handel and Telemann were also members. Bach joined as the 14th member. The Art of Fugue's fragmentary fugue is indeed a fugue about the number 14. Its subject one has seven notes, 14 divided by two. Its first exposition ends at bar 114. Its second subject has 41 notes, 14 in retrograde, and also, geometrically, the sum of J.S. Bach. It hasn't been noticed that the existing section lengths confirm this interest. Exposition 1 has 114 bars. Exposition 2, of the second subject, has 80 bars. The ratio of 80 to 114 is 1 to 1.4. It looks like Bach was shrinking each section by the same ratio. Let's imagine then that the third section, which introduces the Bach theme and then combines subjects 1 plus 2 plus 3, followed the same rule. Its length would be 80 bars divided by 1.4, or 57. If the final section combining all four themes included the motto, its length in turn would be 57 divided by 1.4, or 40 bars. Very likely Bach planned the motto theme to appear right at the start of the fourth section, measured out in this way. As I said, in Contrapunctus 8, which has 188 bars in all, the motto appears in bar 94, exactly halfway through. Bach thought carefully about his planning, or ordinatio. But one conclusion of this is that the total length was to be 291 bars. The other is even more striking. Indra Hughes has already noted that the sections of the fugue shrink by something like this ratio, but we think that Bach had a particular reason. The ratio 1 to 1.4 is the most widely used ratio in art and architecture, and even, for example, the proportions of A4 paper. It's called the square root of 2, i.e. to be exact, 1.414. This ratio is also a 14 number, and its properties have been known since Pythagoras, because root 2 is the diagonal of a square. 
Bach generally wasn't interested in proportional theory, but it may be the case that for the Misler Society, which was interested in music and science and number, Bach worked up a fugue on his own name, both in letters, B-A-C-H, and in number, 14. From this, he could indeed claim that this was a Pythagorean fugue and that his own name embodied a perfect proportion. If so, the final fugue was being planned as a finale, like the St Anne, and may have been intended for circulation to the Misler Society as part of the circulation packet which members had to contribute and written in short score for organ performance and for convenient postage. Was this to be both Bach's last offering to the society, interrupted by his death, and also the Art of Fugues finale? Well, that idea has been explored by other scholars, such as Anatoly Milka. These proportions have been used in the four-subject conclusion used by Anne in her performance, when the motto appears at the appropriate point numerically. Was the fugue so near completion broken off? Is the romantic idea of Bach's death a reality? Or did something else go wrong? We reject the idea that Bach left Art of Fugue incomplete at this point deliberately for his public to finish it. As a good Lutheran, Bach had a stronger sense of duty to, to perfect his art than this allows. There's a famous anecdote about Bach rushing to a keyboard to complete a cadence that the musician playing had left incomplete when Bach entered the room. The fugue starts with a seven note subject. Seven was one of the most perfect numbers. Incompleteness was imperfection. The signs are that Bach did complete the fugue, but that the end was misplaced before it could be printed. This idea seems incredible, but it's really a version of a famous theory by the eminent Bach scholar Christoph Wolff. Wolf argued that in order to make a four-subject combinatorial fugue, the only one he attempted, Bach must have tried out the full combinatorial options first, at least in sketch form. These options may have included an inversion of all four subjects. In effect, Fugue 14 was conceived backwards and then written out in sections from the start, joined up in the final drafting stage. Wolf called the final section a draft, Fragment X. We think that Fragment X was actually a complete ending. That Bach had indeed finished the fugue in a near final draft on the printing paper being used for the engraving in process. But then he got into editorial difficulties, possibly as a result of his eyesight declining. A final fair copy for engraving was never made. To understand this, we need to look at the five pages of Fugue 14. Looking hard at the first four pages, we can see that there's not much evidence that Bach's health or sight were deteriorating seriously. They're neatly and firmly written, as if for engraving. We also note that on page two, at the transition from the first to second subject, around bar 114, Bach examined the draft and was dissatisfied with the transitional bars 111 to 113, which lack a subdominant. A really bad mistake. So he added a bar with a proper subdominant and a soaring soprano, but in tablature.
This error meant that this proof could not go to the printers. Bach may very well have cursed quietly under his breath, having spotted this too late. Because the fugue was written in sections, he also found another problem at the transition to the triple combination, which breaks off once it was set out, not midway. What this problem was, we don't know, but it may have been related to the first transition problem. This happens on the fifth and last surviving page. This page is a slightly different shape to the four earlier ones and is staved differently. Note that Bach misses out a stave between the systems. Probably because as he wrote the music out, he didn't know where the ledger lines at the top and bottom would fall. So he kept the systems clear and separate. That means one thing. While pages one to four are fully developed near final proofs, page five is a composition page roughly ruled at the bottom. Looking closer, we can see that the transition from the bottom of page 4 to the top of page 5 shows a break in penwork and ink. Pages 1 to 4 might have been copied out by Bach in a day or two at most, but page 5 was not written out at the same time but later. This means that it's not the final page, but a rewritten transition page, dropped in before the final one or two pages with the last bars. It's worth observing that Bach finished the first triple combination, and that suggests an orderly transition to another page. Bach probably rewrote the transition for the same reason he redrafted the transition at the end of the first exposition, because he was unhappy with it for some reason. Instead of correcting it in tablature this time, he did it on a misfit page, now page 5. Note that at one point in bars 229 to 30, the soprano resembles the coda he added to fugue number one. It's also not unlike the bars he added in tablature on page two, with a much more far-reaching soprano. So what happened at the end? We suggest that page 5 is a tipped-in redraft. This means that one or more probably two single-sided pages with the completion simply vanished. The top part of the first of these pages would have been scratched out and replaced by the rewritten fifth page. In essence, this is Wolf's Fragment X theory, except we think that it was complete and not a sketch or Entwurf, as CPE Bach calls it. It's unlikely that Bach would have done the fair copied four, first four pages if the end had not been composed too. When we send things to the printers, we've usually finished them, as well as signing them. Bach, it seems, had in fact written the whole fugue out in a near fair copy. He proofread it, he found some issues, and he rewrote the transitions. But before the final fair engraving copy, in short or long score, could be made by him, the work was abandoned. Then, somehow the final one or two pages got detached. This might seem incredible, until we recall that Bach may not have been in a position to manage his papers very well towards his blindness and final illness. At his death, his editors misplaced or misunderstood the final pages and thought it incomplete. The deathbed theory may have been contrived by them as, in effect, a sort of cover-up for something much more prosaic. Bach probably completed the artifugue, and the paperwork certainly suggests as much. The artifugue may not have been a romantic ruin, but simple testimony to, to the disorder that can follow in the wake of the death of the head of a family. It was for his son, Karl Philipp Emanuel Bach, to sell off the plates of the artifugue in 1756, as it hadn't proved to be a commercial success. Ironically, in that year, Mozart was born. And it was for Mozart to recognise the artifugue for the phenomenon that it was. The rest is history. <laughs>